Okay, uh, let's do um, another application. Um, I leave one thing. So this is going to be what it's called Landau levels, uh, and they're pretty interesting. So it's the problem uh, of solving for the motion of an electron in a magnetic field. So it's called uh, Landau levels for the physicist Lev Landau from Russia that discovered uh, or did this calculation first. So you have a mass M charge Q and a magnetic field B in the Z direction. Now, we will solve it. And I think you will find it pretty interesting. <laughs> but you will be left with a little of an uneasy feeling, I think, at the end of the lecture. Because uh, the problem of gauge invariance is so dramatic that the physics will look a little strange and a, a bit unrecognizable. So let me remind you that in classical physics, if you have a magnetic field B, you can have electrons that perform uh, circular orbits. And the main property of those orbits is that they all run at the same frequency, the cyclotron frequency, QB over MC. So, this is just Newton's law, and uh, the force being V over C cross B. It should be a couple of lines for you to remember that um, particle in a magnetic field goes in circles with that angular frequency. Um, so, um, Okay, there's lots of comments we, we could make about this. Uh, but let's assume we're going to solve for the motion of this particle. We're going to ignore spin. Sometimes spin is important. And when you have spin, you have a Zeeman effect, spin in a magnetic field. So that can change the energy levels by some quantities. Let's ignore it for the moment. It is sometimes relevant, sometimes it's not relevant, and you can easily take care of it. So again, we're faced with having to represent the magnetic field. So um, you have the magnetic field, this curl of A, and we'll take a solution in which A, this time is minus BY, uh, zero and zero. Remember that B is dx ay minus dy ax. And therefore, this works out. It has an ax component. The derivative with respect to y gives you the magnetic field B. So what happens to your Hamiltonian? Your Hamiltonian is now 1 over 2m px minus q over c times ax plus 1 over 2m py squared plus 1 over 2m pz squared. I will not uh, consider z motion. It's too simple. It's it's not too interesting. It's just motion. Plane waves in the z direction is not interesting. All the physics is really happening in the plane. It's the idea that we can constrain ourselves to have orbits of electrons that go like this in circles. OK, so our Hamiltonian is here. Uh, let's write it once again, 2m. Px plus Q 
b y over c squared plus 1 over 2m p y squared. OK. Let's. In order to solve a system like that, um, it's convenient to see what is conserved. And uh, Px is conserved. Px commutes with the Hamiltonian because the Hamiltonian has no x dependence. So h commutes with Px. It doesn't commute with Py because there is a y in there. And uh, OK, so if it commutes with Px, we can hope for eigenstates, energy eigenstates that are also eigenstates of Px. So uh, I will write my wave function of x and y as a wave function that depends on y times e to the i kxx. And it's already a little strange. We were looking for circular orbits, maybe, and the x dependence is really a little funny here. It's almost like plane waves in the x direction. So, OK, well, it, it's a fact. It's true. Um, you could not do that if you would have chosen a more symmetric gauge. You see, if you had chosen a more symmetric gauge in which A doesn't have just an X component, but also a Y component, the Y component would have depended on X, and then X with PX and PY, neither one would have commuted with the Hamiltonian, so things would have been different. But this gauge is easy to solve the equations. Uh, it's called a Landau gauge. And uh, let's just explore what this says. Um, trust that if you're solving the equations and you get a legal solution, it must mean the right thing. So here, uh, in this solution here, Px is just h bar kx. And uh, we can restrict the action of the Hamiltonian to that subspace of momentum, Px equal hkx. We can look at the Hamiltonian. It is like looking at the Hamiltonian for this wave function. We already constrain ourselves to have this kind of momentum. So the Hamiltonian that acts on the y function is the Hamiltonian constrained to the momentum kx. And it's equal to 1 over 2m py squared, the second term, plus 1 over 2m qb over cy plus hkx. It's the qby over c plus the value of px, which is hkx, and I should square it. If you look at it carefully, you see that this is a simple harmonic oscillator, Hamiltonian. There's Py squared, and there's a y with the origin shifted. It's not just a y squared, but it's some sort of y minus y naught at some point squared. So let's write it like that. So I have to make it look like a harmonic oscillator, py squared plus 1 over 2. For a harmonic oscillator, I should have an m here. So I'm going to have an m squared in the denominator. So m, let's get the q, b, m, c squared out. y, I got that out. 
minus, I have to put all these things, minus h bar kx over uh, times a c over qb. Look at all that. Uh, so we factor out qb over c with the m squared here and the m, it reproduces the 1 over m there. Y, and I put two minus signs because I always like to write Y minus some Y naught, uh, which is the equilibrium position of the oscillator. Here, as you pull the C and the QB out, you get all these things. So this is a P squared Y over 2M plus 1 over M QB over mc squared y minus y naught squared with y naught equal minus h bar kxc over qb. That's it. That's uh, the system. One good thing happened already, while this thing is a little funny or strange, I think, at first sight, this harmonic oscillator is resonating with an omega, which is the cyclotron frequency. So that's nice. The harmonic oscillator is that. And therefore, already you know you're going to get levels that are going to be separated by h bar omega cyclotron. So that classical cyclotron frequency is going to separate the levels. And these levels are called the Landau levels, the various Landau levels. OK, so let's see what uh, um, this means or how it looks like. For that, uh, let's imagine uh, a solution. So how does a solution look? So here is x and y. And suppose I take a kx which is negative. This kx is any number you wish at this moment. So kx negative means y naught positive. So here is uh, the y naught is here. And the wave function is certainly the probability density is independent of x. So the wave function sort of has support all over x here. And it represents an oscillator in the y direction. In the y direction, you're oscillating. And well, you're going to oscillate a little. Uh, we know, in particular, there's a length scale associated with the oscillator. So let's look at that length scale. Um, the length scale on an oscillator is h bar over m omega in general. But now we have an expression for omega, so h bar over m. And omega is qb over mc. So this is square root of hc over qb. And we're going to call this the magnetic length. So this is for an oscillator. A nor arbitrary oscillator takes this value. So let's call the magnetic length hc over qb. This magnetic length. So it's a nice definition. And that's roughly the width of the state. You know, if, imagine you're in the ground state. You oscillate from the harmonic oscillator, the typical length scale. 
And in this case, is the magnetic length. So in the ground state, this size is LB. And that's how your orbit looks. In particular, Y0 has a simple interpretation here. Y0 is equal to minus kx times the square, uh, this uh, magnetic length, is that right? Um, squared, so it's minus kx times lb squared. And the units work out because k has units of 1 over length, and uh, you have a length squared, so that's y0. So, so that's how the um, orbits look. Now you would say, OK, so where are the circular orbits? Well, they're not quite so visible here. You have to do some work to find them. And uh, in particular, what is happening here is a very strange thing. I, I think, uh, well, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Uh, uh, if you have this as your harmonic oscillator, your energies that may depend of kx and ny, those are the quantum numbers you have already. Well, this is a, just a harmonic oscillator, so it's h bar, the cyclotron frequency. Some people call it the Landau frequency. I don't know. Uh, a occupation number for the oscillator times one half, the usual formula for a harmonic oscillator. And here is the energy. And well, you had a plane wave. How, why don't we have a piece, the p squared over 2m of a plane wave? It's nowhere to be found. Uh, that doesn't show and doesn't contribute to the energy. The mathematics has shown it for us. So this kind of dependence doesn't do anything. It's an absolute degeneracy. The kx. So you could construct a superposition of states here using Fourier transforms in which you somehow localize this in the x direction by superimposing degenerate energy eigenstates. So this is the most important thing about these Landau levels. The Landau levels are the different levels of ny. So ny equals 0 is the lowest Landau level. Then you go ny equal 1, ny equal 2, ny equal 3. But each Landau level is infinitely degenerate because you can put different values of kx and the energy doesn't change. <laughs>